And we are live. Awesome. Welcome to the millions of viewers on the internet. Many of them not even born yet. <laughs> I mean, a live event is like for a moment, right? But the internet archives are forever. Exactly. Or at least until the zombie apocalypse comes. Right. So for viewers tuning in, my name is Josh Wolf. I'm streaming live from Auckland, New Zealand, 13 hours or 12 hours in the future from uh, Nigeria and West Africa, where I'm joined by my guest today, David Odoi. Uh, thanks for joining, David. Yeah, thank you for having me. I don't know exactly what we're going to do here. You sent me a bunch of like super cool looking stuff. Right. And it looks pretty exciting. Not, yeah, I've not been able to do most of these things. So I thought, you know, this would be like a perfect opportunity to get that, um, to get those things done. So just run yeah. through some ideas in my head and then just send them. Yeah, okay. So you, you work mostly with Java in your day job by the look of it. Yeah, exactly. That's true. Do you want to give like a bit of a kind of an introduction or a background so people can get a sense of who you are and what you do and what you've been doing? Okay, yeah. Um, so I've been... I've been a software engineer for, um, say, for the past, say, six, seven years, I guess. Um, but then professionally, I would say the past four years. You know, mm. at the beginning, I was just dabbling around various technologies, you know, not necessarily programming, per se. I was just dabbling with Linux, you know, tweaking some Linux um, settings, doing some cool stuff with it, or things I thought were cool, actually. So then I did some, um, I tried to learn networking and then tried to learn penetration testing, but then I realized, you know, you can't actually do a penetration test for something you don't understand, right? So I decided, okay, let me drop this, learn how the web works or how the internet works, and then I can come back. And so that was how I was, that was how I got stuck in the world of programming and I've not gone back since. Awesome. Classic hacker, starting with like penetration testing and like how do I take this? How do I break this thing? And then like you take it apart, and then it's like how do I put it back together again? <laughs> right. It was kind of frustrating because I didn't really understand what I was doing then, so it was frustrating because I couldn't get a lot done. But then, what you doing? Classed for me. Sorry, were you doing it like at university? Were you at university or were you just like doing it at home or? Yeah, it started when I, I started when I was, when I went to the university because that was when I got my first laptop. I got my first mm. laptop and like a week later I got admission to the university. So I just went there. For the first year, I didn't do, any, I, I didn't do much with the laptop. It was just there looking at me. And then I decided, you know what, this thing, this thing has been lying down here for a long time. Why don't I just pick it up and try to do something with it? So that mm. was how it started. I think that was around 2012 or so. Cool. And what were you doing at the university? Yeah, I studied um, computer science. In the university. Okay. Yeah. So that was so when you got your first computer? In, yeah, in 2012. And funny enough, that was the first time I knew how to actually like operate a computer. Like I was attracted to it initially but i was this very um should i say an introverted person right? mm. so if i see somebody with a laptop i don't i just look right observe but i don't yeah. you know i don't approach a person to say hey let me try something out or stuff like that so that was how it went till i got my first laptop and i realized that oh you can do some stuff with it install some software and then use the software to do whatever you want that was how it started for me and um, I'm surprised that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm here today as a software engineer. Wow. <clears throat> okay, so I got a question. So are you telling me that you like went to university, started doing a computer science degree and got a computer and you hadn't used a computer before that? Um, not so I've, I, I did it. I, I had used a computer, right? I went to this. Um, I think in my junior secondary, I think that's, uh, I think you call it like junior high school. Um, then I went to this um, 
mm-hmm. computer this you know you call it computer school where you just go there for like a few months and then learn microsoft word excel and stuff like that so that was all i was okay. introduced to you know i could type right on the on the on microsoft word open a new document write some yeah. excel commands and stuff like that but that was all you get i could mm. boot up the system but then it was not a laptop actually it was a desktop so then i could browse the internet you know then i was so um I so much liked um, cartoons, Cartoon Network. I don't know if you know it, and um, yeah. WWE. Yeah, so I was always going to the website to see the latest WWE match and stuff like that. So, awesome. yeah, that was how. So that 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 was the only prior knowledge I knew before I got mm. the laptop. But when I got the laptop, uh, you know, here after after high school, I didn't want to just sit at home and wait till I get admission to college. So I decided to go for an um, NIT course on um, Computer A+, computer, system, computer Maintenance and Repairs, right? So mm. it was during that period I got admission into the university and also got the laptop. And was it a Mac? Because I, I know you're using a Mac now by the look of it. Yeah, no. Uh, then, it was, um, then it was a... Um, a Windows laptop, HP ProBook 230S, I think. Yeah. Okay. This is fascinating to me. So you you basically embarked on like a career and of academic study and professionally, and <clears throat> it wasn't like you were like fully into programming. I mean, how did you know that that this is what you wanted to do? At yeah, that that's point? Yeah. yeah. It's funny because when I started. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't even know that you know this this could be a career, mm. right? When I started, it was just you know this is something fun. I like, I felt like, I like, okay, let me say, I didn't know that there was already an existing career path I could take with you know just writing code. Mm. Get, I just knew that I could go to the, I could go to school, become a you know study computer science, learn more about this computer, and maybe from there we we'll see how it goes. You get, so that was the plan. Right, and I knew that yeah, people write code, but I was not really, I, you know, I, I, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm not seeing anybody in Nigeria that writes code, right? So I didn't know that there was a career path already for being a programmer as a then you get. So I just found the computer fascinating and I really wanted to just write code. And then also in school, you know, we are doing basic, Fortran, Pascal, but I because those languages were kind of old then, I was not really fascinated by it. If you had mentioned Java, mm. I knew that, okay, hey, hey, I've heard Java before, and it's kind of like huge, I would have been more interested. But because we are doing basic Fortran and Pascal, I was just only reading it just to pass my exams, not to really go mm. into it. But then later on, when I started you know, doing stuff on my own, and then eventually they brought in Java, C++, and some web programming to our curriculum, that was when everything really clicked. This was in the university degree? Yeah, yeah. So, so you actually studied basic Fortran and Pascal in your university degree? Yeah. Did this. Epic. That is so cool. Wow, man, you did like the full journey from the 80s <laughs> into, into the current day. Man, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't really fun for me because I, I, I was like, you know, you know, we you know you, we are on the internet and see what other people are doing. You know, out there in the other you know, in the Western world, and you know, you you really want to be in the in the you know in the current trend you get. But then you realize that this language you are learning are languages from the eighties, probably from the seventies, and yes. you know, it's 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 even harder to get resources. You get to even improve on it. I know you could probably write a very good Pascal code now, but mm. you know, but getting resources for for those kind of um, if you go on YouTube, you know, you just Stack need, Overflow. It's like nothing, right? So there was no much resources to really, you know. So so everything we're just doing, you just learn it, pass your exam, read the books that were that were given to us, you know, and just let it go. But then on the you know on the side I was doing Java I learned Java as the first programming language or the first high level programming language I would say I learned Java I learned JavaScript PHP 
when I learned PHP, because of how easy it was to just build, you know, a web software. So that was how I, you know, I just stopped at PHP, learned HTML, learned CSS, and I was, then I was building different websites, um, most of which I don't have anymore because I didn't know about GitHub then. So mm -hmm. most of those files were lost, you know, sometime. Yes. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah, I started, I actually started programming in basic. Yeah. Um, in the eighties. Wow. Yeah, friend, I, I had a friend whose um, parents bought one of the very first Apple Macs. And I remember right. when I walked into his house and I saw it there, it was like something out of the future, you know, it was like in the eighties in New Zealand, like there were no computers around really. And then there was this Apple yeah. Mac there. And then some of my friends got like Commodore 64s, a VIC 20. And, um, I got an Atari computer and started programming in basic. And then I got a book out of the library and it was a book about Pascal, but there was no Pascal compiler. So I just wrote all my Pascal programs on paper. And then I eventually got a job working in a company assembling computers. You know, all I did was like screw components into the motherboard and that was pretty much it. Um, but I managed to get myself a computer and, um, I got my first professional programming job programming in Delphi, which is like object Pascal. And, uh, it was developed by Anders Heilsberg, who then went on to develop C sharp and then TypeScript. And so these days I write most of my code in TypeScript because it's kind of like, I'm like super connected to, um, you know, the creator of it and, and Java came out at that time. I remember downloading it and Delphi had a full integrated IDE and it had drag and drop for like UI creation. And then with Java, it was like you had to create the hello world example was create this class and then compile it and link it and then execute it. And I was like, dude, this is a lot of work just to get it to say hello world. <laughs> so right. I kind of missed the whole java explosion and then i came back to it years later when i was working at red hat and um <clears throat> i totally get what you're saying about you know taking things apart and like looking at them and examining them because in red hat we had like lots of stuff written in python and then i was looking at c code c sharp then java and then um javascript and figuring things out backwards but not being able to build them from scratch and then I was like, okay, let me get into like actually building the stuff from scratch. And so these days it's mostly JavaScript, but I do some stuff with Java because I, I did a lot with Minecraft, which is written in Java. And then I went to Kotlin because that was like an, a more updated version of Java yeah. and uh, Go because it was like, okay, this is hot and new. So let me try this thing out as well. Exactly. That, so I... For me, Go was introduced to me on a particular project I was supposed to work on with a very good friend of mine. Um, so when 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 we started, you know, I was I was just feeling like you know what I'm not going to do this. I just I just I was just looking looking for a project to work on, right? So I said mm. okay, I'm going to do this, and you know, writing code without reading documentation first is just the most just the wrongest idea ever. So I started and the guy was just complaining. I was like, man, what are you writing? What is this? And I was really writing rubbish because I would just Google, okay, how do I loop in Go? Yeah, yeah, in yeah. How do I define a variable? That old project didn't go far um, for some reason. Um, so I decided, you know what? I don't, you know, I don't want to ever feel this kind of, I don't want to feel like this anymore. Let me just go and learn this Go programming because it seems like it's very hot at that particular moment. So I went mm. back, learned it. And then I think some other time the guy called me back and was like, hey, can you come and join me and work on a project? So that was how we started working on multiple projects, you know, for a long time. And the guy really, really helped me in building my career. Awesome. So there's like yeah. a bunch of different things that you uh, kind of have got that we could work on. I mean, they all look exciting to me. Which one do you think we should do? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so when I was, when I was compiling the, um, that list, I was thinking through it, and I, and I felt like you know it would be it would be nice if we could get one that could fit into the old two hours um, that we have mm. here. We get so. Um, I think let me just look at that list again. 
Okay, do you want me to bring your screen up on the? Um, I could just look at it from here. Do we have to like um, show it on the screen? I guess, I don't know. Yeah, we can do it. Hang on, I'll add your screen and ready? Here we go. Magic. This is yeah. pretty cool. This is all streaming in the browser. It's incredible. <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay, so let me copy this out. Probably put it in a note or something. Um, and then let me make my screen full screen. Here we go. So I'm VS going code. To, uh, yeah. Just create a new folder for this particular project. Um, I mean I'm in the habit of putting everything just the way go, you know. Organizes it. I just love this. So I'm just going to create a folder here and call it uh, uh, let's say live stream. Open this, creates a, oh. I wonder what version of Go I'm running on my machine. Let's have a look. I haven't updated it for a while. <clears throat> Go version. It says, uh, okay, no double minus maybe. 114.6, my Am I living in the past? <laughs> um, one dot fourteen, right? I don't think so. You're not that far. Okay. Um, I think it's currently in one, one fifteen or oh, one sixteen. I got to update, man. Go download for Mac. Although I'm using one, I, I I'm using one fourteen though. So okay, so maybe I should stay on that then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll upload. I'll I'll update later. Yeah. So from the list here, I think. Yeah. So you mentioned that you use a lot of JavaScript these days. Um, so maybe. I mean, um, I'm 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 most familiar with um with JavaScript, Node JS yeah. especially. Um. Yeah. And so that's probably where I could be of most value. And yeah. um, also learning to program more in Go is pretty, sounds pretty cool to me. What about this pointing poker yeah. one? What's this? Is that a JavaScript oh, project? So, uh, no, not really. I've not, like, so, so this first project here, so this, this first one I mentioned, um, I was using this, I was, I was, so we are work, we use this for, um, for creating, um, or for deciding on points to give each task. Ah, uh, so I see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Estimation. Yeah, exactly. So, um, while we are using it, although, you know, it seems so. It's you know, it feels simple to use and stuff like that. You know, I really like it though. Um, mm. The only issue I had with it then, when we used it, was that when the votes are being done, right? Let's yeah. say you know we are gathered, you know, probably like in a meeting or stuff like that, and you know the first task is put on the screen. It takes a while for everybody to get in sync on their phone to say, okay, this is the task we are uh, we are voting mm. on. They get and you know we are all on the same you know on the same network the company's network so i feel like to, you know the um syncing between all devices at that particular time was not really um as fast as it could be so i so i thought to myself you know what if i build something similar you get that 
the, the you know the main aim is just to make sure that that's you know the part of actually you know adding points is um it's really really fast we get okay so that was my main aim for this particular project but I, but um thinking about it it's going to be like a very huge you know thing to work on, on you know on this particular stream so yeah, okay. yeah that's for this um for this first one then the second one here is um there was uh so at the at the at the time i was doing um freelancing on mm. fiverr right and somebody oh, yeah. came to me, yeah and somebody came to me and said um I think I, 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 he didn't tell me or he didn't mention where he was working. So he was like, he was trying to get something done. Um, I've forgotten the whole architecture he explained, but then they were using um, HA proxy that uses um, um, proxy protocol V2, right? And what this does is when you have a proxy, you know, between two, a, a client and a server, right? Yeah. So what the server sees is the IP of the of the proxy, right? But apparently, with HA proxy, you can get you know the actual um, IP address and port of the client making that request. You get so um, I don't know if that's actually correct, but um, I know that. So when he sent it to me, I think they were using something like uh, I think they were using Kubernetes or so. And then HA proxy was like, you know, in the middle. Um, mm. So it was like, hey, I can't get the actual port where the where the request is coming from. You get okay. from, yeah, from using this um, HA proxy um, protocol. So I built something for him and we could get the port, right, um, mm. from the request. Um, so the way the way it was set up was if I'd send a UDP um, request to a particular server, that server is going to return with whatever you know with the um, with the payload of this HA proxy. So what I'm what I what I was to do was be the UDP server that would that would receive that payload, pass it, and get the port. That was just the main thing I needed to do. So okay. I get I, I got it working, but I decided you know what I could just create I could create a package that would just you know make make it easy for people to just make use of this um, you know decode this HA proxy um, values that is being gotten. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I was going for. Okay. So this one. <clears throat> this project is it's working now and it's a matter of like packaging it yeah so um so it was not it was not in a full project because it didn't give me like a full um this is, i'm just going to open this and um say um, let me see if i can remember the name of that project so i'll just go to i was looking at it there yet but i've forgotten the name so I think this is it. Um, yeah, this is it. So as you can see, it just it's all messy here, you know, getting mm -hmm. some bytes, you know, and then passing it, then printing it out. Protocol signature, protocol version the address and the um, transport protocol and family and stuff like that then i think what i was what we are trying to get then was this either the sla port or the dla port maybe oh, no sla port i think because this i think this is like a destination port or something okay so what's the go sample udp oh, okay it's uh looks yeah. like it's a private repository oh is it no. Yeah, I think so. Um, okay, what about what about that this one then? Because this one's kind of like attractive to me because it's in Go, which is an opportunity for me yeah. to learn more about Go. The other thing is, um, if it's something that's like generally useful to other people, yeah, then um, 
it's an opportunity to become famous, which is basically what this is all about. <laughs> right? Like people can uh, use, it gets, you know, top of hacker news, that kind of thing. Yeah. How about we do that? Why don't we like turn this into a reusable package and then submit it to Hacker News? Yeah, we can, definitely. I'm up for that. I reckon that'd be pretty cool. Is um, So you did this originally for a Fiverr gig. Um, I guess it, it's su sufficiently generic that it doesn't contain anything specific about the client's architecture or anything like that. It's just a generic utility kind of thing. Yeah, yeah just generic utility. Um, it was just generic. There's nothing. There's nothing here that is. No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, because all I was just getting was just the payload um, from the UDP socket. You know, pass it, and that's all. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think okay. if I can. Yeah. So the code is open sourceable then. Definitely. Something that you could. Okay. How about we do that? Let's open source this thing. Make the world a better place. Yep. Um, there's a lot of text here, so. Yep. So we'd need to do like a readme on like how it works and how to use it. Yep. Maybe clean up the code somewhat. Are you using uh, VS Code to do your Go programming? Yeah, I do. Um, I do use VS Code and okay. Vim sometimes. Vim, uh, epic. So the main reason why I'm using Vim was uh, so I have it. So I'm, I was working on a project, or let me say I'm still working on a project where um, there are multiple packages, or no, there are multiple modules inside the repository, and VS Code doesn't handle that very well. Uh, okay. Yeah, so um, so it's it's a microservice architecture. So each um, each service is like you know its own module. Each service mm. is its own module. Uh, I can only get it working if I open each of those services as a workspace of VS Code. But if okay. I open it in Vim, Vim just you know gets it right. So I mostly use Vim for that particular project, but because I'm still learning Vim, let me say that. So, yeah. yeah, so I'm just using that to build the project and learn Vim at the same time. And it's going pretty well, but every other thing I just use VS Code because I'm, I'm, I'm faster right now with VS Code. Okay, cool. I can set up my VS Code for Go as well. That'd be great. Okay, so there's just a Go set of uh, extensions. So if I just go into extensions, uh, file new window. Yeah. Um, okay, so do you want to make that? Do you want to make that GitHub repo public then, so we can work on it together? Yeah, it's, it's public actually. It's it actually is. a fork from a Go sample UDP server, and mm -hmm. all I added was just um, so the the UDP server at first I don't think it was working, um, so I got it to work, and then I added the part where I could pass the old protocol, which is all this. Yeah, so it's actually public. Um, how do I send you? In, oh yeah, in I see it. Yep, I got it. Yeah, all right. Okay, so it starts from this Go sample UDP server. Okay. Okay, I've got the Go extensions installed already. Um, okay. <clears throat> How much is the code modified? Oh, I can check from the commit history, right? To yeah. see. 12 commits ahead. Compare. Hmm. Okay, cool. Let me check it out. Um, okay, go back. Uh, um, uh, 
or maybe I should fork it and then that way I can do pull requests. Sure. Yeah, let me do that. Well, we could create a new, we could create a new um, repository for it because um, since, since it's going to be a package to just um, decode what mm. is from this, so we could separate the UDP server from the package that actually does the decoding. You get right now. This is just both the UDP server and the hack. yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. So so the UDP server is really just there. Um, to be a UDP server, and then you've got a decoder yeah. in there. At the moment, the code is coupled, and you want to decouple them. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Let's have a look. Go into my works, but oh no, that's right. This is um Go, so I've got to go into. Are you go go path. I used to have like an like a sample of, um, of the packet been received but i just could i just can't find it yeah ah. in this repository let me see if i have it in a different repository because hmm now but then If I so I forked I forked the Go sample UDP repository. Yeah. And if I want to clone it onto my machine, I go into my Go path, which is Golang SRC GitHub.com. Should I fork it? Sorry, should I check it out in in my own like JWolf underneath there? Or um so you should probably put it in your Go path. Yeah. Uh, but Right now, with Go modules, you know, Go modules has helped to eliminate the necessity for you to put it inside your Go part. You get. Yeah. So, uh, I just, you know, out of let me say, out of habits and helps, you know, and Go part helps me organize my code. I just put, I just use the Go part. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that that was something that really like I was like, okay, too complicated. I le like learned the first way that it was done, and then there was that whole kind of fork in the community where there were like two different Go module solutions, and I was just like, dude, I thought Go's idea was to make everything like only one way and simple, like yeah. standardized formatting everything. Now they got two different module solutions. I'm confused. Uh, not not uh, not even. I think I think there are there, I think there are more than two. I think there's Deb. Um, I think there's one other um, um, dependency management tool like that. There's Deb and then Go modules and then one other one I've uh, forgotten. Mm. And one of them is kind of like the almost sort of like Java, where it's like everything is like in one place and it's all like namespaced exactly and it's yeah. like no or no python python does it like that you have those one set of dependencies for everything and then there's the node yeah. modules kind of idea where you have the dependencies per project inside the project yeah. folder yeah in go it's um go.mod then the i think the go.som file tries to lock it to a particular version i think okay yeah. Using hash, I guess, yeah. Okay, so I've checked it out. Um, wow. It's just like eight eight spaces indentation. So with so uh, I, maybe maybe you you should share your screen so that um, yeah, let me see. I remove this one, share my screen, easiest with two monitors, blah blah blah. Um, share this. Uh, here we go. How's that? Yeah, cool. Move this over here. Yeah, cool. Okay. Get this thing out of the way. Goodbye. How's that? Nice.
Nice um, thing, by the way. It's pretty Blowing. cool, huh? Yeah, I know. Epic. It's called uh, Synthwave 84. It's got a special hack in it that makes that glowing effect happen, but it, it, it makes your um, VS Code think it's corrupted until you use another extension to tell it that, you know, forget about the checksums. Okay, so let's have a look at the code. You've got the imports up here. Uh, some variables get defined. Flags. Okay, so it takes command line flags, has some defaults, some help text about what they do. Yeah. So for um, most of the UDP server part was built by, um, just so that we are not plagiarizing here, um, mm -hmm. I think on GitHub, his name is Ciro Costa. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ciro Costa. Does he have a license on his? Uh, um, I don't think so because I, I messaged him and um, okay. when, I, when I fucked it, I don't think the server was running quite well. Okay. So, so you fixed it? On um, Twitter, I think. Hmm. Yeah, zero W R S. Yeah, I think so. Zero cost. Yeah, this guy here. Where is he from? Sounds like a Brazilian name. Um, Portuguese. Wow, this is a pretty pretty epic blog post he's written. I'll just have to confirm. Yeah, here he is on Twitter. Works at v VMware. Okay, cool. Um, anyway, it's on it's on the internet, so and it doesn't say, you know, copyright like or anything like that. Uh, yeah. All good. So there's a server, and so it's just a UDP server, and then this is the protocol decoding here, is it? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, exactly. And that's the whole protocol decoding? Yeah, that's, um, so that's not all, Yeah. but that was the part that I just needed at that time. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so if we wanted to extract this, um, how would people use it? They would have to create some kind of UDP server and then use this module inside the UDP server. Do they inject it in or do they, do they need to write, do people write their own UDP servers? Um, yeah, I, 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 I would think so. Cause, um, yeah, definitely you build your own UDP server to receive the packets in the first place. Okay. And, um, when, once we get the message, you know, we use the package that, we, that we would eventually build, you know, to pass, you know, whatever data is gotten and, you know, retrieve those information from it. Okay. Cause in, in, um, Oh, look at that. He's got the number one hit for a UDP server and client and go. Ooh, Simple yeah. UDP server. How do I write a UDP server? Okay, so people write these things from scratch. Because in Node.js, of course, you would use Express probably, right, to do like some kind of server. I don't know, I think Express does UDP, but. Okay. Uh, I don't, I don't, so I, I've only used Express for just building HTTP server. Yeah, exactly. So I wonder if people would use this package, like, would you make it as an extension to a, a f existing framework or just a standalone utility package? Mm, I, think, oh. I think it should be like a standalone, okay. I guess. Because yeah. this looks simple to build a UDP server, just that's it. Right. Yeah, we could even make use of this, you know. Um, it's like a demo. Yeah. Okay. So, I, so, the, so when 
I, if I can remember correctly, when I was building that, I had issues with the, I think the first UDP server I used also. Um, I think that was the reason why I said I, I, I messaged the person that created it and told him I was going to make some changes and stuff like that. Okay. But, um, How do I build this? Let me just, okay. Um, have you, uh, yeah. I think there's a make file there. So I think maybe we should just check. Oh, yes, maybe say make. Um, let's just see. Yeah, oh, look at that. See. Yeah, make build, so. Okay. See if it will work. Um, okay, it's got a file permission error trying to copy something into or opening something. Seago runtime. Mm, any idea what this error means? Can you see it? Uh, let me see. Runtime, Seago, go build. Mm. Permission denied. Um, Let's try the Googles. Might be the first one to have this problem. Ta da. Should probably be coming from one of those commands, one of those oh. um, tags. Minus I, it says. Similar issue. Change the owner from root to my user group. Um, oh, well, let me just copy a random sudo command off the internet and paste it into my terminal. Oh. Chamod777 epic. That fixed it for me. Use a local go. Um, ls minus l. Use a local go. It all belongs to root. I wonder why. Mm. How did you install? Uh, did you, how, how do you install go? Did you use homebrew? What a great question. Probably yes, no, I don't know. I downloaded the package maybe. I think I downloaded the package. Did I do it wrong? Um, I don't think so. What's my username? Who am I? Cedar Party. Okay. Yeah. So Chamod minus R. I'll just, I'll, just, I'll just take ownership of the whole thing and see what happens. I mean, to do since you are trying to change from root. Yeah, right on. True that, true that. There we go. Invalid file mode. Chamod, no, chone. Um, yeah, so I don't think, um, while you are doing this, though, um, I mm -hmm. don't think that was the guy I messaged on Twitter about that stuff. Because I have to just go and make sure I was saying the right thing. All right. It works. UDP server. Oh. Winning. That must be a very misleading message. Sending to. <laughs> okay. It should be listening. Listening on or something. I think so. Okay. It should. If I'm not mistaken. Um, I will have to, I think I also need to clone this on my, on my system because I don't have it. Okay. File with contents to send over UDP. Okay. So flag string input. So I can actually, um, send a file over UDP. Oh, oh look at that. Very cool. Yeah. Input string. Oh, it's a st string. Where does this get used? Okay, so it's actually a file name. Either via mm -hmm. STDN. Oh, okay. So if I just run it, then I can just type things. Like I can just type. No, no. 
Yeah, I think so. Um, hmm. Okay. Is this, I think this is running as both a server and a client. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think this says as both a server and a client. Um, can you just scroll up to the flags? Let me see. Yeah. Oh, is yeah. server false? Okay, so I got to run two versions then. Yeah. So here I run um, UDP um, double minus server and then true like that. Yeah. Yes, running as a yeah. server. And then I can go yeah. like this. Woo! Yeah. Explody. Index out of range. So it seems, yeah. So it seems that the part where it's being passed, we are trying to, the message is not as big, or maybe it's not as much as it wants. So it's trying to read um, what is being sent. Um, still going to have the same error. Okay. Yeah. Is there some because requirement? The, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the HA proxy payload that's been sent is quite large. Okay. Yeah. So just sending a small text is going to have um, index out of range error. Yeah. Because okay. It, because it's expecting something really large. Yep. So to build, make build. Uh, uh, if you get an error, let's see here. Make it easy for the next person. Sure. And if you get the error that says this. Nice. Whoops. I'm using the Helmac layout and hide and save are right next to each other. You word wrap. Um, okay, cool. Mm -mm, to build. Okay, so do we want to extract the... Um, uh, I guess we should get it to work first before changing anything right you said i think you said before david that you've got like you had like a sample payload like for testing yeah, like i i had it yeah i remember where i copied oh, I, I remember i copied and pasted it it was in a go playground um it was in a go playground um what is it called the environment um well right now i don't know where i have that link if it's still existing though yeah okay <clears throat> and ha proxy ha proxy tech blog hmm. So where does this thing sit in relation to HA proxy then? So it goes into Kubernetes. So I don't have like, um, so I don't have like, so all I did was just get the payload, yep. you know, pass it and get what, what I, you know, what is needed, right? I didn't have access to the, whatever is running on the infrastructure. We get, okay. Yeah. So you don't know how they deployed it? No, I don't, I, I didn't know that. I, I think I can't even remember how I got the payload, but I knew that I think it gave me a URL that if mm -hmm. I send a particular message to that URL, I would get back something. Okay. Yeah. I think that was how the whole environment was set up for me to work on it. Yeah. Now I did see something in here that said something about length. Let's have a look. Source layer address. 
my edges here. Length of data. Yeah. Okay, so. Is that, is that correct? Because that spelling there is. Um, yeah, I think I think I probably spelled it wrong. It's supposed to be G T H. Yep. And yeah. is this like, what does this actually do here? So data. Mm, so what? What does um, that do? So what has been sent back is in bytes, right? So um, how to read. Um, Certain parts of the message. Let's. I think so. I think the first twelve bytes is the protocol signature, as stated, you know, by the online seventy nine. While um, line eighty gets the. So at, um, when you get when you get the first twelve bytes by putting twelve there, it gets from zero to eleven. Mm -hmm. Right. So on line eighty, I'm getting the twelfth byte. Okay, so this is zero to eleven. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then um, line eight C gets the um, the twelfth um, the twelfth byte. Um, I think the I think the comment there explains more. First four bits, which is one byte. Um, okay. No, eight bits, one byte. First four bits is the version. Second four bits is um, command. If it's if it's zero, it's local one proxy. Okay. Yeah. Transport protocol address family. So that's the thirteenth yeah. byte. First four bits contain the address family. Lowest four bits contain the protocol. protocol. Address length and bytes and network Indian order. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Epic. <laughs> Super cool. I remember when I was working on this particular project, I uh, like passing this, passing this, um, these values gave me hell because yeah. I didn't really understand how. Because after getting it in bytes, converting it to an actual value that could be readable was hell. Mm. I think I printed out the bytes. It was printing out some weird gibberish on my terminal i remember sending yes. it to a friend of mine i was like guy have you seen this before it was like mm. uh i think he gave me the idea to actually pass it the way i'm doing it right now which i've forgotten by the way but as we read the code i should be able to understand what's going on yes okay so um okay so basically this function here is the thing right yeah so but maybe the interface for this package is it i don't know it exposes a function that takes a packet and then returns like the metadata yeah we can we can start with that definitely okay and then um yeah okay so Maybe we just create a new file and put it in there just like refactor it out of this main file so we keep the udp server Yes. Although doing it without a test for us to be able to tell whether it works, it's like, <laughs> anyway, YOLO. <laughs> um, so I'm still, I'm still trying to see if, um, cause I, I, I remember, I, I remember I just storing the example payload in yep. a file here. Okay. And I got a file here or a um, Go Playground environment and then storing the link to that Go Playground. Mm. Just don't know why, why I can't find it right now. So I'm just trying to go through my um, commit history to see maybe I deleted it somewhere. Okay. Uh, this is why it's important to always document this. Copy UDP request for real testing. 
UDP test helpers for Go. Maybe this. Provides UDP socket test helpers. Mm. Let's go back here. that tool that was for capturing maybe we just start a um, ha proxy instance yeah we copy cool. udp so let's have a look ha proxy docker yeah docker hub Can help you find bugs without deploying your server software on your production servers. This looks good. Smoke testing, distributed stress testing, uh, install on the source host, UDP copy on the target host. Test it on Linux only. Okay, let's just do this. There's no copy this and paste it to run this thing. <laughs> uh, do we have to create a Docker file for it? Um, really? Since no two users of HA proxy are likely to configure it exactly alike, the image does not come with any default configuration. Oh. Evil. Uh, Bud. Okay, let's do this. Uh, once again, um, okay, then I need to get an HA proxy. You know, for your desktop, you could um, like create a, um, a new desktop, copy or, you know, move your VS code to that desktop so that, you know, could do your own live stream there. Move it to a new desktop. Yeah. So I think I was talking about your um, cause every time you minimize it, you know. Oh, that minimizing a thing is me accidentally hitting the wrong hotkey. <laughs> I've got what? like this muscle, like a you know, a muscle memory for the wrong hotkey combination. <laughs> um, test the configuration. So we've got to get an HA proxy configuration from somewhere. Uh, Docker build, run the container. Mm. I'm just drawn to stuff, you know, around the cloud. Things like Kubernetes and stuff like that, but I've not always had a chance to just go deep into it. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's see if we can get an HA proxy config. Here we go. Oh, examples. This is what we need. Yeah. Just copy and paste and code from the internet, man. Um, goodness. Which one? Oops. Debug to HTML. Hmm. Um, why not blob? This, this is, doesn't look like a config file, does it? No, it's, it's a, a, um, a shell script. Yeah. Here we go. Dot CFG is the one we need. Check dot conf. No. Okay. Whatever, we'll grab this. Raw. 
seems to be the copy those line numbers as well. Yeah. So we'll grab the raw and then add it in here as HA. Docker file. It's called haproxy.cfg. Haproxy.cfg. Um, in that case, I might as well put it all into a folder called Docker. Um, get rid of this one. Delete that. Move to the trash. In the make file, it's. Um, CD Docker. Yeah. Yeah. Build it. Here's our haproxy.config. Okay, so listening port, which IP to bind to? It's going to bind to all of them in the container. So there was a running command in here because I need to do some binding. No. Um, I think we could even test the configuration with that first command there. Oh yeah. Syntax check. Minus F. Use a local etc. That's the name. Minus C minus F. But how does it bind the uh, HA proxy config file into the. Oh no, you have to build it first. Okay, yeah. we can do that. Let's see if my make, make Docker, let's see if that works. Make Docker is up to date. <laughs> Okay, I made a mistake here. Maybe Docker build or something. Can I do make Docker? I think Is that work? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. So I'm going to have to do this manually. Okay, CD into Docker and then run this thing. Yay for fast networks in New Zealand. <laughs> yeah, we are. Um, well, down here you can get some pretty fast networks. I think mine has been holding up pretty well yeah it's good it hasn't dropped out or anything yeah what's it doing like it's down building um, downloading pieces and stuff so yeah I guess like in terms of like being able to it's it's kind of like this is like kind of meta work like we're not actually working on the code but in order to be able to test it and then it's especially when you come back to it years later, right? Like how long ago did you write this code? Uh, 15 months ago. Okay. And then you come back to it and it's like, oh, how does this thing work again? Exactly. I was looking at some of my tweets from a um, conference that I went to a few years ago. It said, you're always working on a team with at least three people in it. There's you in the past there's you right now and there's you in the future. <laughs> Very correct. Very correct. Okay, I built it. Let's try running this command then. Cutting and pasting commands from the internet. 101. I guess I'm just going to run that and see what happens. Fatal errors found in configuration. Hmm. Unknown keyword content demon though they're all unknown. Mm, Haproxy.config. Unknown keyword port out of section. 
it doesn't like this config file at all. Hmm. Oh, this is HA proxy 1.8, and we're running HA proxy 1.7. Oh. That's why. Um, let's find another version. Let's go back here. HA proxy 1.7 get. Tree. Examples. Um. auth.cfg transparent proxy let's use that one a full transparent yeah. proxy for a backend that sounds good what does it say to actually make this work extra firewall nat rules are required uh, it needs to be compiled with support for this okay maybe not that one Maybe, what's this one? Yeah. But no, it looks the same as this. It looks the same. Yeah. Uh, can you scroll down to the end? Let's see if they are the same. Maybe, maybe we didn't copy everything correctly or something. Yeah, looks the same. Yeah. Looks it's almost, same. it looks exactly the same. It's funny because some of it's XML. Yeah. And then some of it is like just, I don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> and two ports, there's no equals for the rest. Yeah. Equals. It's like you can't it make up its mind what its syntax is, right? <laughs> this was either a schizophrenic programmer or like three programmers who couldn't like agree on what the syntax would be. One guy's like XML all the way. It's not even XML. I don't even know what this is. Man. Maybe we just go ahead with no tests, eh? Yeah. Let's just go ahead and see. Okay. Yeah, if we pull this thing out of here and put it into um, a new file, can I just create a file called like um, UDP decoder dot go? Does that work? Um, I didn't get I, I didn't get your question right. Oh yeah, so like in terms of refactoring this function out of here, yeah. So we got like this this go. So this is a go routine here, right? Yep, yeah, runs in its own kind of separate thread, and then it takes this thing here. So we can basically just grab yeah. that code, I guess. And then put it into a new file. Yeah. And then call it function decode packet. Yeah. And then paste that in. Yeah. So um, since we are working in a package that we we would want the this method to be called, we should change the D in the decode packet, the first D to capital. Oh, yeah. So capital it makes it public, right? Um, and then how do I run go format on this thing? Go FMT. Format document. There's no formatter for go files installed. That's no good. Go custom format. Um, when you install that first, uh, it's supposed to, I think, did it tell you I want to install some, um, okay. Ah, it's not it, was, it was disabled. There's a fly in here. Go away. Um, install all, whatever. Yeah. So you can install. Run go get install all. Maybe you can do it. Format. Um, you have to wait for a while to install. I have to wait? You mean it doesn't do it immediately? Like by magic? <laughs> Okay, well, it's doing that. So, okay, so we made it a capital letter that makes it public. Yeah. You might you might need to install a magic extension to do this kind Mag of magic. 
Yeah, exactly. Cache the internet in the background. So while I'm typing, it's just caching everything. Needs an artificial intelligence, you know, that figures out, ah, he's probably going to do this next. Yeah. <laughs> so here we're reading this thing from the buffer, right? But we should probably pass it in yeah. as a parameter. Um, I think buffer is going to be... Pass in the buffer? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of the type, what yeah. type buffer is. And even PC as well. We might need to get it as well. So. Okay. So um, where's buffer here? So very, very bad naming of the definition. No definition found. Install all. Ah. Um, go to the type definition. No. Where does this come from? Just maybe we should do like a search. Yeah. So buffer uh, is here. here. It's a slice of bytes. Oh, so you're just making it? Yeah. Okay. So the type in the method is going to be just a slice of byte. It's the data then. Is it? This data? No. Uh, so, so you know we are passing the buffer right now into the new method that you just created. Yeah. Right. So the type of buffer is going mm -hmm. to be a slice of byte. So just um, the brackets and bytes. Um, after after the variable name. After the variable name. Yeah. So confusing. Which way <laughs> did, round do these things go? <laughs> like I this? Think, I, think, I, think, I, think get, I still have that issues even, even till now because um, what I do on the daily is Java. And Java has the... Uh, in front. Yeah, in front. Yeah. So and I then get, Kotlin, it, uh, Kotlin has it after, like TypeScript, oh. with, with a full colon. Wow. And it's optional. <laughs> so the, um, the colon is optional or, what, or the type is optional? The type is optional. Okay. If it, can, if it can infer the type, then it doesn't need it. Or, or just install everything. Do all the things. Okay, so we get this buffer in. It's a slice of byte. Um, yeah, in, in this one here, where you create it, where do you actually read it in? Um, so yeah, so if you scroll down, scroll down a yep. bit, yeah, so pc.read from is going to mm -hmm. read into the buffer. So I think, I think the name is read kind of confused. From, uh, read into the buffer. Yeah. So I think PC is kind of like a stream where okay. data is. So let's look for where PC is defined. Defer so PC, PC closed, net yeah. listen packet, I see. So PC is going to read into the buffer. Okay. So in terms of the surface area of the interface, maybe would you pass in, have a function, pass in the PC and it creates a Go routine? Yeah. Um, so yeah, you pass in your, your, your listener. Um, so if that's the case, I don't think we need to pass in the buffer. Rather, the buffer should yeah. be created, you know, just after the, after the met, after the method is called. Yep. So let's have a look at how we use it then. So you would do something like so. PC is a packet connection. Okay. Yeah. Um, defer PC closed, and then you do something like um. Uh, what do we call it? Decode. Decode yeah. packet, like, packet like this and pass in channel, the packet connection. Uh, I don't think this would be right because what if I know a different method is using that PC connection? You know, they'll be reading it, you know, probably the oh, same can, time. You can right? only so, read it once. Yeah, exactly. So we have okay. to just read it, pass in. We have to read it. Passing the, what we have read into the method to decode it. Well, what about this idea? Because okay. at the moment, um, if something else is listening to it, right, uh, it would do this. Yeah. Right? What about if what we do is we change this method 
so that instead of doing that, you do that and you get back exactly what you would get from this, but you also get back the decoded packet. So we'd have a struct that comes back, which has the decoded packet and also has like a buffer property in the struct field. And we just put the buffer back into the struct. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm quite, I'm, I'm quite clear on that. Um, so basically what we're doing is we're extending this method here. Yeah. To return this plus the decode packet. So this thing would return. I'm not sure how you write a struct and go, but like, um, is it struct? Yeah. Um, um, type the name of the struct and then struct. Okay. So, so type decoded packet. Yeah. Struct like that. Yeah. So it has, um, I don't know, length. They go after, so that's like a number. Yeah. Um, int. In int. Oh, yeah. Int 64. Yeah. Okay. And then it has like your protocol signature. Yeah. Which is string. Yeah. Um, and then. Let's, let's just see it's less of byte for now. What do you think? As a byte uh, instead of string. Yeah. Okay. And then it has all the stuff, you know, like your whole decoded packet, and then it also has the buffer on it. Okay. So you have access to the raw buffer. Okay. In, in which case you never need to do this. You just use this instead. And so this decode packet method will do everything that this does. Yeah. And this. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Cool. So it's like, it's called a, I think it's called the facade pattern or something like that. You wrap it around the thing to extend yeah. it. So it's like a buffer plus. Sure. Sure. Um, so that's cool. So the only, my, uh, my, I think the only concern is we then have to make sure that when we call the code packet, we don't use PC, you know, let, let's say, because since PC is like a stream, and yeah. once we call the code packet on it, and then it gets those, um, it gets those bytes and store it inside, inside the buffer, that yeah. cannot be read anymore. Yeah. Uh, so if we made a mistake to probably call a, a different method on that same PC again, you to read, you know, right from where it stopped. Mm. Um, okay, so that may not work for people then. So maybe um, they have. I think yeah, I, I think I think it's okay like this. I think I think it's cool. What you said is cool. Because the other is way cool. is they would manually yeah. read it and then pass it in, right? Yeah. Well, I think I think it's cool because. Um, even if you call a different method, you're just going to read the next um, the next um, bytes, so it's not going to have any issues. Yeah, I think I, I think I, I think I lost my thought there. No, uh, I I think I get what you're pointing to. It's like either either it's like a utility that you call on, you, like you have to manually demarshal the buffer into something and then send it to the decoder. Yeah. So. Um, the decoder will just do just one thing, get, you know, the bytes and then just decode it and then return it back. Okay. Yeah, okay. So in that yeah. case, it doesn't return the buffer. It, it takes, okay, so it takes a buffer. So the programmer is responsible for reading yeah. from the buffer yeah. and then pass it to the, so in that case, it would go like this, like that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. How does this get? Oh, I see. So, okay. So, you are, are you attaching it to? Oh no, you're writing the messages out. Yeah, I think I'm writing the errors into that file also. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I don't know where that file is created. I can't I can't remember exactly. Uh, so maybe... does does this here? Um, 
When you call PC read from buffer, is this like a blocking operation that waits for more data to be available on a stream? Hmm. Um, oh, yeah, here it says here, we block until there's new content in the socket that we're listing for new packets. Yeah, yeah. Whenever oh, new no. packets arrive, buffer gets filled. Okay. Cool. Okay, so then in the UDP decoder, how do I say that it returns this decoded packet struct? All right, Does so it goes after here? that. Yeah, exactly. Like that? Yeah, cool. Okay. So, whoa. Yeah. The Magic. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there's a protocol signature, the protocol version. Um, which is like a slice of byte again. Yeah. Um, we might probably, um, so the reason why I said, or the, the reason why I suggested that we use slice of bytes is because I'm not really sure the type of data that each of those bytes are going to eventually be. Right. Okay. Yeah. But we know that we are reading a slice of bytes from others from line 24 down to line 28. We get so we could just use that as a placeholder for now. Okay, but probably we want to make them more concrete types than that, right? So that they're more usable. Yeah. Um, do we need to pass back the protocol header length? Um I think so. I, I guess so. Okay. And in the struct, does it make a difference if I make them upper or lower case? Yeah. Um, so they should yeah. all be uppercase. Yeah, they should all be uppercase. Um, the whole idea of um, exporting those fields. 16 plus binary big Indian. Uint sixteen. So, is this a Uint Uint sixteen type? Yeah, probably. Or, can you just yeah, if you scroll down a bit, I would confirm. Let me see. Um, yeah, I think so. Just highlighting on it will give you the type. Type? Yeah, it's not doing it. Hmm. Expected yeah, okay. package. Package, package main, I think. Okay. Uh, yeah. Package main. Well, we might probably, since this, since this is the decoder, we might probably create a new package for it, but this works. Okay, should have a comment or be unexported. Decoded packet. Extract, yo. <laughs> um, doesn't like that. Is it need some special kind of comment? Nope. Uh, no, not really. I maybe the. Um, how do I add tags? Nope. What? Do, how do I? Um. Mm, um, okay, maybe it needs this kind of comment. I don't ah, know why it's still... Okay. That's what it needed. Optional leading article. Actually, just use it when I'm doing those comments. Sorry, I missed that. So, yeah, I said I, I, I use the double slash or uh, double backslash when I'm doing those comments too. So I, don't, I don't think it's um I don't think it's necessary or I don't think it's necessary to have you know those okay to make it work. So you reckon just like this will do it? Yeah. Look. That should be genius. Yep, that's it. Okay, what is it like this? Same thing. Um oh man, it really enforces you to do some good programming practices, hey? They're like Yeah. That's one. 
so the first day, the first day I installed this extension and I started using Go, I was like, wow, wow. Because I, I think I was coming from JavaScript or PHP then. Mm. Where you can do anything that you want. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the satanic satanic programming languages do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law <laughs> it's like the anarchist cookbook that's a good name for a javascript programming book what about so how do i pass this in then this is like being part of the catholic church you know you have to say exactly the right thing at the right time yeah <laughs> I've, been, I've been to a mass so, so i'm not uh -huh. all that i'm not you have to um, you have to know when to stand up when to sit down i've been to right. I, I went to a catholic primary school but it's so long ago i've forgotten you know but i go there you have to stand up sit down i'm watching everyone what are they doing i think at one point i fell asleep Seth. uh -huh. yeah was it, it wasn't like super old school in latin uh no not 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 everything but uh some of them some okay yeah epic old school um so, so just, we pass just, in the buffer here yeah passing the buffer then you can just pick off line 22 to 26. so we should be good oh, okay this whole thing like that yeah okay cool 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 um, maybe so Maybe we, should pass, uh, maybe we should return an, um, an error as well, just in case um, we encountered an error when. But how I yeah. do that? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we can get brackets. rid of the in brackets. Yeah. Like this? Uh, yeah, hello, more. hello. Yeah. Like that? Yeah. Okay, and then we can get rid of uh, the file logging and the channel management stuff. There's no channel management, that's it. Yeah. Uh, three errors, it says. So there's an error here. PC yeah. undefined yeah. dungeon. I think we're not done anything yet, probably. Try returning nil nil. Let's see that will, that will, that will solve it. Oh no, I just needed to save it. Oh, okay. Oh. It, it doesn't actually do the linting until you save it. Yeah. Weird. Okay, so n's not defined now. Oh, because n comes from here, n address error. Um, so maybe we should pass N as well. N? Yeah. Okay. So it should take N, which is a, what? what is N? Size. I think that would be more descriptive. Uh, good call. Uh, so I should be N64? Like um, just an N to do. I think. Okay. I need to spend all of the memory budget of the application. Hmm, still complaining. Oh, that's because okay. we didn't change the name here. Size. Cool. Here we go. It likes that. Okay. Very, very, very bad naming. I did very, very bad naming. I did here. <clears throat> The message, I think that's pretty descriptive. <laughs> oh boy. Oh, the address is yeah. B N and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, well here it's it it needs what this address, what is that? Hmm. That comes from reading it out of here. Yeah. The size, the address, and an error. If you if you hover on if you hover on 
read from should give you like a documentation on what it returns. Ooh. You know what okay. address is. Um, hmm. Let's okay. Um, so if you hold command and click on read from, it should take us to the definition. Let's see if we have more information from there. Okay. Yeah. Um, experimental. Yes, experimental. Um, okay, read from reads a packet from the connection, copying the payload into P. Yeah. Okay. So it's really kind of read from connection into P. And any error. Oh, oh, okay. So this, what a... This is an interesting idea because what it does is it does two things. It it kind of mutates this thing that you pass into it. Yeah. And it also returns this stuff. So it's got like two kind of it's got like a side effect and a return value. I don't know if I'm a big fan of that, but whatever. Um Okay. Um, it just don't say it. Don't, it just don't say anything about address. Oh, about address what it is. is. Yeah. Well, it's a. It's a network address. Yeah. That must be the address. I don't know that that it came from. Oh yeah, that's true. That's true. Since, since it's a UDP packet, you need to know where that packet is coming from because it, it's a connectionless. Um, it's connectionless, so if you, you can't tell which right, address. There's no stateful from. connection. Yeah. Okay. So, but now you see, okay, um, size, so, um, source address. Yeah. Um, so ADDR would have to be from the package where PC is from. So you go to the definition of PC. Um, PC. Yeah. Just scroll up a bit. Net packet con. Net packet con. So I think Net. I think it's like net dot ADDR. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So now we're passing in the size, the address, and the buffer. Yeah. Well, if we, if we look at it very well, I don't think we actually need the address. Because um, right where it's being used, it's just to print out. Where yeah, right. Going. If you already yeah. knew what it was, yeah. Okay. So we can take it from where it's been used. So we get back the size and the buffer. Du, du, du. Oh, it's freaking out now. Why is it doing this? Uh, get rid of this. Okay, so let's go back here. Um, we do the decoding and then this is just really output, right? Yeah. So we don't really need any of these. Protocol header. The message equals this. So what's the message then? The message is the protocol header? Mm. No, I think that protocol header is like... Um, the um, the point in the um, slice of array where the message begins. Where the message begins. Yeah. So okay. I think that. So that's kind of the payload. Yeah, because um, from what I can see here on on line twenty eight, I think I'm adding sixteen to the address length. Which is everything up to here. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, and then this means everything from that point onwards. onwards. So would this be the pa packet payload? Yeah, um, that it should be. It should be. Okay, the, so we can call uh, this payload. Like I remember, whenever there's a message, um, yeah. I think if I send, I think if I send hello, also to mm -hmm. the to the link he sent to me, the old yeah. um, HA proxy payload comes, and then that last part would be what I sent. Okay. I yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so we got all this. We don't need to have this anymore. Yeah. Take this out, and then we want to return it in this struct, right? So we got like protocol header length, the message. The message seems like a funny name, um, like actual payload. Yeah. I don't know, what would you call it? Oh, well, message. <laughs> and it is a slice of byte again. Uh, let's just use that for now, like I said. You can yeah. change it. Okay. Um, address length. Do we need that? No, that's meta. Really, these are the ones that we're interested in, right? Source yeah. layer address, destination layer address, and ports. So, source oh. yeah. layer we address. We actually interested in all because it's going to be like a decoder for the yep. AJ proxy, right? Anybody yes. using it, just pick up, you know, take off whatever he or she wants from it. Yeah, okay, perfect. So we could return this as a, um, oh, I'm learning, I'm learning. <laughs> the net dot a DDR, DDR. Yeah. Source layer, address, and then destination, address, something. that yeah okay so there's the struct that comes back decoded packet error um i don't see where we generate the error but we'll get rid of this stuff now it's probably freaking out because we're not returning anything how do I create a struct? Um, you, um, so return. I think we need to create it first before returning, right? So create it first. So the decoded packet. Yeah. Um, colon. Calls. Yeah. Decoded packet. Packet. That how I create a struct? Yeah. Exactly. Boom. Okay. Well, length is kind of. I don't think we need that, do we? Um, no. Protocol signature, which would be protocol signature. Uh, protocol version, which would be protocol version. Am I doing this right? Should these be yeah. semicolons or? No, comma. Okay. So what doesn't it like about this? Okay, it says that protocol version is type byte. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Next. Transport protocol address family. Let me guess. Nope. <laughs> oh, it's also a byte. That's pretty cool. It's only suggesting the things that can actually fit in there. And then next is protocol header length. Uint 16. Bam. Hey, now that it's got all this experimental stuff uh, loaded in, it's actually pretty cool. Slice a byte message. Yep. Wonder why it's not picking up the message. Okay, work. Now we need to create um, 
and address. <clears throat> um, is this right? Go back here. It has an IP and a zone. I think um, we had. Oh. Sorry, you've gone. Um... Sounds like your internet connection's having trouble. Uh, I'm losing you. I'm not. I'm not getting it. Makes an assumption that we're on IPv4 only. Oh, David, you still with me? Oh, dropped off completely. Hopefully he's going to be able to get back. Um, Decoded packets. So um, this ADDR thing that we put in here, it's type net.addr like this. That. And in here. Hello. Hello. Interface. Can you hear me? Go to the definition. Can you hear me? Okay, it looks like it's going to be better to return it in the pieces. Address and port. Hello. Hey, you got like a power outage or something? Yeah, I did. Um, should we back up um, maybe in like a minute or two? Okay. Does that happen maybe. often? Um, yeah, it happens often. Um, I'm even privileged to be here where I'm expecting him to be back in you know, a few minutes' time. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Luckily, your internet's still working. Are you like on your cell phone or something? Yeah, on my cell phone. And uh, I think I thought I was using my phone. Oh, it's breaking up again.
And then we need um, source layer port, which is of type slice of byte. And then a destination layer port. which is a slice of byte. So source layer port, which is SRC, it's a layer port. And then the destination layer port, which is DST port, DLA port, save, okay declared but not used and just return it return decoded packet wrong number of return values i don't know is there such a thing as a try catch let's get rid of this we can take this out we'll leave it in the main for now out. IPv6 addresses are 16 bytes. Let's take out the error return value, just for simplicity. Okay. okay, so the decoded packet. Um, HP proxied. UDP packets. That led. So protocol signature. I wonder how we cast it. Okay, like that. So this, it's not really going to be a slice of a byte. It's going to be a net dot port. That a thing? Oh. What has net got an address? Um, Paras IP, that's interesting. Um, <clears throat> okay, there's obviously a lot of um, kind of convenience stuff that could be done now because the consumer of this struct is going to have to cast these into things that are actually usable, depending on what they are. Okay, so readme. Let's update the readme. Um, UDP packet decoder. Utility and then work in progress. Okay, so um, UDP decoder main. So in here, what we would do is we would say decoded packet ping, yes, decoded packet, I'm just going to finish this and then we'll call it off. Okay, so decoded packet equals decode the packet and then you've got to pass in 
Buffer. Declared but not used. Oh, you got to pass in the size. So let's rename this to size. Boom. Yeah, okay. Decoded packet dot protocol signature. Capital P. Yeah, beautiful. So we can get rid of this. And that. Yeah, beautiful. Not sure what that does. Goodbye. Decoded packet dot protocol version. Oh. Okay, that's not a thing. Rest length. Nope. Address length. 14 to 16. Okay. Cool. Get rid of that. Get rid of this. Here we can say decoded packet. This has been pretty cool. It's like programming and go, and I got my um, <clears throat> what doesn't it like about this? Oh yeah, okay, we called it. Uh, this should be destination layer address. Normalize the naming convention. That. Okay, and here we go. We can make this into an int then. This is good. Where'd that come from then? Binary big Indian encoding binary. No, oh, it's in. What? Oh yeah, okay, it's the wrong type. Uh, not that. Dun dun dun. Okay, maybe it's just a uint16 then. uint16. I fixed it. Good, good, good. So we go down here. Mm, okay, I don't know why it needs two, but whatever. Decoded packet dot source layer address. No source layer port. Uh, view word wrap. Okay, yeah, why it keeps turning the word wrap off. Okay, convert to integer. 
I'm not sure why it needs two int. I send in the original value. Let's just take this off. Take this off. Dun dun dun. Um, okay, just keep that. Keep that. So here, decoded packet dot destination layer port. I need to convert to integer because it already is one. Okay. Decoded packet dot. What's the message called? Message. Decoded packet. Dot message. So, um, it makes things a whole lot more simple. There we go, got the decoded packet back. Oh, okay, let's give that. Okay. Take a buffer read from a UDP connection. UDP network connection, not even a connection though, port, listener, socket, I don't know, listener, and decode layer source and destination addresses. I think that's what it does. Okay, that didn't work, so we'll get rid of it. The README work in progress. Um, uh, HA proxy, UDP packet decoder. Main.go for usage. Moment, still needs refactoring. Okay, so, um, oh, let's see if it still builds. Uh, make, so, make, make build. Building, it built. Okay, close enough for rock and roll. Let's create a new branch, which we'll call um, initial package refactor. Uh, okay, let's go here. We're going to add this readme UDP decoder. It's pretty much all we need. Yeah, okay. Say initial refactor. those changes and then open on github Boom. this will give me the opportunity to create a pull request there we go compare and pull request Oh, hey, welcome back. The power is been, back on. Yeah, I've been here for a while, though. Um, oh, okay. Sorry. I was fully scary. absorbed. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Um, so, yeah, I'm just about to open the pull request. Oh, nice. Where is it? Somewhere. Oh. 
here it is it's behind that um so this is just like um it builds at least yeah uh refactor code into separate package it still needs a bunch of stuff to be done but like basically yeah. um let's bring up vs code Ding. here's what we got done so main.go now instead of doing the decoding in line it calls the method nice it passes in the size and the buffer and then you know i just replaced all of that inline stuff with the struct that comes back and i noticed that you were casting the source layer and destination layer ports to a uint 16 so i just did that in line down here okay and then like you said probably some of these bytes and bytes the yeah. slices can be converted into more meaningful types yeah inside the library or the package yeah. Yeah. So um, while while I was waiting, I was trying to um, get like uh, um, more information as to a um, what's it called a sample packet that we could use. Yes. So um, I, I think I remember um, being sent a pickup file. So. Maybe what I'm going to do is um, open the pickup file, get a sample of the payload from it, and then okay. run it against what we just built. Epic. And then here's one other thing I discovered in here. Like this .NET IP can take a 4-byte um, yeah. IP4 or a 16-byte IP6 slice. At the moment, it's hard-coded to a 4-byte one, right? Yeah. But then I notice also that there's this address length here. It says address length in bytes in network Indian order. Yeah. Does this actually define this range? Um, I can't really tell. I'll probably have to check the documentation of okay. AGPROC to get more information on that. Where does this get used? Yeah, just just below it. So um, since we are adding 16 on line 29 to the address length, so I'm guessing the next 16 bytes. Um, so if you add 16 to so the last one there is 16. So if I add 16 to 16, that's about 30. Um, that's about 32, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm guessing um, on line 35 down to 38, mm -hmm. we are getting these details from the extra 16 bytes that we added to um, the address mm -hmm. length to get protocol header length. No, I think yeah. that six the sixteen bytes here represents yeah. the sixteen bytes up to this point. So the first sixteen bytes, so the first sixteen bytes of the protocol are known. We know what they are because we have them all here. Yeah. Then the next one is either four bytes, or it's either four bytes Ooh. or sixteen bytes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think yeah. So this yeah. is either four for IPv4. Yeah. Then 16 six for IPv6. IPv okay, 16, sorry. Yeah, for IPv6. Because yeah. then you've dynamically dealt with it here for the, getting the message, but then it's hard-coded oh. here, it assumes. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I, get, now, now I get what you were trying to say at first. Yeah, maybe you need to do some maths, like division. I don't know. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh no. So 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 uh, if it's addition. yeah. Yeah. I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll look into. I'll look into it more, and give you an update. 
Okay. And then um, I think the main thing to make it like super useful as a package is to have like a good readme file that explains exactly. what it does and how to use it. Yeah, definitely. You know, like I was trying to, I'm trying to do something with discourse at the moment and then like have a look at this. We go to discourse. Like a, it's it's what the ZB forum runs on. Mjs.com. This course. Yeah. Try and node discourse API. Ah, oh, this one's actually pretty good. No, it was debt collective. That's right. Debt collective. Yeah, these guys have a discourse. Let me do a search here. Find a repository in their thing called discourse. Discourse node API. This is like the most up-to-date discourse node package available. So they're obviously developing it. They're using it. And there's the documentation. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, <laughs> what am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> so I actually had to go and read the source code, you know, to figure out what it does. Cool. And yeah, I'm like, who's got time for that? Um, okay, so let me create this pull request. Cool. No conflicts. There it is. Awesome. PR in your inbox. Yeah. Thank you very, very much for that. Awesome. Yeah, let's keep working on it, you know, asynchronously. And um, when it's ready, let's push it on to Hack and Use. I reckon it's got some cool. legs. <laughs> I mean, you nice. never know. You never know what's going to be the one that, like, goes viral on Hack and Use. Exactly. Yeah. I saw, I saw you liked my tweet about the... Um, meaningless repetitive work book that i wrote yeah oh, I mean, it job ads. Just, yeah it was just before i got on the stream i saw it i was like oh nice cool but yeah. I, I i didn't get to read it so i'll probably go back and read it it's a pin tweet right uh yeah it is yeah yeah so i'll go back so, and read it so there's the search hack and news thing right here it is hack and news search so if we have a look for my name on here, um, no, it's got to be, what else could it be? Meaningless, repetitive work. <laughs> four points anyway you can see it, it's a, a couple of them got covered you know in the register cnet um but there was just this one that i think there's a link to it in the book itself it exploded on hacker news and got like hundreds of comments and you yeah. know it was just a job ad that i wrote and then somehow it got on hacker news and blew up so you never know what's going to explode on hacker news you know it could be it could be this. Yeah. <laughs> Probably needs a new name. Um, or it could be something else. But anyway, you just got to throw heaps yeah. of stuff at the wall and see what sticks, right? Exactly. That's, that's, that's the fun in writing code. That's the fun in writing code. You know, just build things, put it out there, and you never know who it's going to help. Yes. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Awesome. Well, thank you for the opportunity to, to work on this with you. Make a small contribution. Thank you to very, very much. The world's number one HA proxy decoding package for Go. <laughs> right. It needs a catchy name, like a cool, a cool name and a logo. Uh, 
this days this there's any any library that is written in go they just append the go ha proxy go this go that so maybe we need something more catchy than that go ha proxy decoder you know ah, there's a really great go go programmer in um tanzania jeffrey ernest yeah, um, do you know him yeah when i when i joined um when I joined the because on the Gof, um, Gopher Slack um, Gopher Slack workspace, there is mm. um, um, Go Africa, right? So when I joined, it was very active there. Him, Anthony, um, yeah, this other guy, Anthony Mwan, Anthony Mwans, what what is his name? It's no, something um, like Anthony Anthony Alaribe. Okay. Um, yeah, then um, Alex, I think a way to more, something like that. I think it's go, it, it, it goes by Influx Six or something like that on Twitter. Um, I think additional, those are they, you know, they are very, very active in the Go community, both in Africa mm. and here in Nigeria. So, yeah, that that I found what out about um, Jeffrey because when I was working as yeah. a um, recruiter. Me and this other recruiter, Harold, we were like into like super esoteric kind of things. Like, you know, we would yeah. find a guy who was like Brisbane's number one and only D programmer. He was from Ukraine and he programmed in D. And I was like, I got to meet this guy. So he comes in, <laughs> his laptop screen is like cracked in half, you know? And yeah. then he's like programming on it. And I'm like talking to him about it. I was like, oh, is this, um, are you running KDE on here? And he's like, oh, no, I run Slack slackware i think it is it's where you have to recompile your it, it's like linux from linux from scratch or something and you have to um, wow. recompile everything wow. and he's like yeah it takes me three days to recompile my system but it's like ultimately optimized for my cpu i'm like bro i don't think it makes that much of a difference <laughs> but he was like fully into it uh, but yeah, yeah, then Harold comes to me and goes, I found this guy, Jeffrey Ernst, who's a Go programmer in Tanzania. And he had written, um, what's this thing called? It's like a web framework. Um, I think I remember. I saw it. Um, is he Flow? Something like that. Yeah. And then it was like, it had like tons of stars on GitHub, but or, no one had ever heard of him. Or Go Kit. I think mm, it was, um, oh, man, the name is on the tip of my tongue. Um, no, I don't think so. Jeffrey Ernest. Let's have a look. Yeah. It's called Utron. Oh, okay. Yeah. Utron, a lightweight MVC yeah. framework for Golang. It has 2.2 K stars. Wow. Hasn't been updated for a few years, but yeah, it was just like, it was massive. It was on Hacker News and it was written by this guy who like had like two people following him. I was like, he's got 2.2 thousand stars and, and on LinkedIn, he was on LinkedIn and he had like one connection or something. I was wow. like, why is nobody hiring this guy? So, yeah. I was like, we should try to get him to come to Australia. See if we yeah. can get him to move here. But no, nah, he's <laughs> staying there. He's making it happen. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned you mentioned it actually on um, that the on Stack conference. When I heard it, I was like, yeah, I think I recognize I recognize that name. It was one of the first names I heard about in the Go community when I joined. Yeah, it's actually, there's a book called uh, Traction. It's written by Gabriel Weinberg, who's the founder of DuckDuckGo. And he talks about different kind of traction avenues. There's like, I don't know, 50 of them or something or 25. And yeah. one of them is engineering marketing. And basically what you do is you create some kind of useful utility or library that you release and people use it. And then they find out about your product from that. So, you know, if you're Slack or whatever, you make some, you know, thing that people use and then they find out. And I mean, it works also for individual branding and traction as well. 
you create some useful kind of utility yeah. thing and release it. And that's how people find out about you. Yeah. Personal, personal Definitely. branding. Definitely. Definitely. I'm, I'm trying as much as possible to um, do more open source contributions and stuff like that. But I'm always, always like very busy and I'm trying to cut it down, you know, because of the old stress and, you know, work life balance and all that. So, um, mm. and also when I do stuff like this, you know, it brings back the phone you get after, um, so like I said, when I started programming, it was all about the fun for me. But now mm. it's it's no longer it. Let me not say it's no longer fun. It's becoming stressful. But when you do things like this, you know, something that is out of your normal day job, you get, mm. you get that you get that thrill. You know, it brings back the fun memories back again. Bring, or it just it brings back fun back into programming. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, baking this thing, making it like really nice, polish it up, put it out there, see what happens. Definitely. I'll definitely see to it. And then the other thing is you could um, keep streaming it as well. You know what I do with the stuff I make is I put a link at the bottom, say, yeah. and I streamed this live while I was making it. Here's the video. <laughs> So right, if people right. are interested to see how it was made, they can go and watch it, you know? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So maybe I'll just gather some of the resources. And once I feel like, okay, I'm, I'm good with the resources, then I'll just create a live stream of me putting things together, creating a readme, making it work, testing it. Stuff Epic. Like yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, it's free to start a Twitch channel, you know? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I I think I took a look at it before I got started with it, or before we got started with this with this stream. Sorry. Yeah, and then if you want to do um like bring other people on like this, then you can use Streamyard, which is also free. Yeah, yeah, really, really. So cool. those two things together are really great. Yeah, and then like if you want to come back on on uh, on this stream, you know, when it's like ready to roll. Definitely, definitely. I would like to be back. <laughs> Yeah, awesome. Yeah, it's great so really, hanging really out. Fun, and... you know, exchanging ideas. Um, um, you're writing Go as if you've been writing it for, for a while. Um, yeah, it was really fun. You know. And then there's all those other cool ideas that you had that we could also do something with too. The Golang proxy thing. Yeah, but yeah, I reckon finish baking that and get that on Hacker News, man. 100%. So, Whack it up there. So, And then the Twitter fleet downloader looks cool as well. I don't even know what Twitter fleets are. <laughs> so there's this, um, you know, like um, WhatsApp stories and um, Instagram stories. Yep. Yeah. Yes. That's the... That's what it's called now on Twitter. It's called fleets, but just basically stories. Okay. Yeah. And then you download actually, it. Yeah, I actually asked a friend of mine, I was like, do you have any idea that you would want to get worked on? And the guy was like, he doesn't have any idea, but it would be nice to have a downloader for fleets, you know. There's already a downloader for normal YouTube, um, sorry, Twitter videos already. So it, he just said, you know, fleets, and I said, okay, fine. I'll just add it to the list. If it gets picked up, I will inform him. Okay. So maybe you probably just check it out some other time. D dude, I can see a real simple way of doing that. You write a uh, like a Tampa monkey. You know Tampa monkey? Uh, no. Tampa monkey is an extension that you can run in your browser, and it allows you to load arbitrary JavaScript on the page. Okay. Oh, oh, so, oh, 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 I think I've heard of it before. Um, there's a tool so that you can basically, it. yeah, you just basically write a jQuery thing, you know, at the yeah. start that says for every fleet uh, element, you know, div on the thing, add a little button that yeah. says download. Yeah, definitely. Um, just that fleet is not on Twitter for web yet. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That makes it a little bit more difficult. Yeah. 
So, I don't know if you, I don't think you can run Tampa Monkey on like iOS, probably on Android, because Android you can just basically do yeah, anything, right? A lot of things, a lot of um, things to do. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. When you want to come back on again, just um, let me know. You know, if, if you've got that calendar link, you can just book another, yeah, book another time. Sure. Sure. I think next week is um, maybe Aruna Fatima. Okay. I'll definitely join. Definitely join and watch. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks for hanging out and uh, taking time out of your evening on a Monday. Thank you very, very much. It's great coding with you. Great meeting you and spending time with you, David. It's awesome. You too. You too. Have a great night and I will see you again soon. Yeah. Soonest. Awesome. Thank Take you care. Opportunity.